welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Catherine Clark. Ontario Lieutenant Governor David Onley is a best-selling author, a veteran television host, a father of three, and also the first disabled person to hold the role of Lieutenant Governor in Ontario's history. Onley and his wife Ruth Ann, a country gospel singer, sat down with me recently for a chat, and I'm delighted to present that interview to you now on Beyond Politics. Lieutenant Governor David Onley, Mrs. Onley, welcome to Beyond Politics. What a delight it is to have you both here today. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I was wondering what happened. I was saying before the show that normally we start at the beginning and we work our way through on these interviews and we find out all about people. And I thought what we should do today is start when you accepted this job because um, it was obviously a very important but also life-changing event for both of you. And so... I thought I'd ask what happened. What, what happened when you learned that this position was being offered to you, Your Honor? Physiologically, your stomach is not supposed to be able to do a complete barrel roll, but I don't believe that because mine did a complete barrel roll. So it was completely unexpected, well, really? Well, I, I knew that the call was going to be coming yeah. um, because there is an interview process. Okay. You literally do get interviewed, and uh, you certainly get checked out. Um, but it was told to me that within one week, within seven days, I would be told one way or the other. So there was no, no guarantees. Uh, I'd heard that it was just down to two, possibly three people, so I knew the odds were just bad. Um, but it was uh, day six, and oh, there had not wow. been a single call. And uh, when the call came and I was at work, um, I took the call, and the individual identified themselves as being from the Prime Minister's office. and. Before I had a chance to even think that, okay, this is it, this is the call, yes. he just continued on to say the Prime Minister needs to speak to you tonight. And right there I knew it because the Prime Minister does not call to tell people they didn't get something. Right. <laughs> there are course. staff members that do that. So, <laughs> so I, I knew right there and that's when my stomach did a complete flip. <laughs> and did you have to go on air after that? I did, 20 minutes later. Oh my goodness. And it was the final time that I did my program that I had done for seven years, seven and a half years, a, a weekly science based and technology uh, program. And um, I can honestly say I had absolutely no recollection of who was on the show, what was said, <laughs> how I got through it, I really don't know. I just changed the sign off at the end of the show because every week I would sign off by saying a few words and then, and we'll see you next week. But this time I just signed off by saying, uh, it's been a pleasure. Now, a couple of the very, very astute members of my crew, I saw them just look right up and look right at me. Isn't and that interesting? They knew something was up. Right. You know? But I still couldn't say anything for about another week until it was made public by the Prime Minister's and office. And when you got the call from the Prime Minister's office, what yeah. happened? What was, or, or from the Prime Minister himself, mm -hmm. what was the reaction at that point? Well, I was, uh, I, I was driving up the Don Valley Parkway and I, I told them that um, if, if they could just hold off making the call until I got home, I wouldn't have to take it in the car. And they said, well, he's got to fly out to Nova Scotia tonight, but uh, we'll do our best. And I got to the top of the uh, Don Valley in the 401 and uh, started to head east towards um, our place because we live out near the uh, Metro Zoo. And um, the phone rang and it was the Prime Minister's secretary saying he wanted to speak to me. And at that point on the Highway 401, uh, you can't get off. You can't get off. <laughs> there's no place to stop. And so this silent prayer went up of, Lord, yes. don't let me hit anyone yes. or be hit Please by Please don't it. let me be pulled over. Yes, yes. That yes. would be the ultimate excuse, wouldn't it be? I'm sorry, officer. I'm, I'm talking I'm to the Prime Minister. I'm just talking to the Prime Minister. <laughs> and it was raining. And it was raining, yes. Yeah, so it, it all added together. So it was, uh, so that cell phone, with, my kids even then, uh, this is a good five years ago now, told me that, Dad, this, this phone you've got, it's so ancient and everything. And it was even then because um, I just used it, you know, to use phone, make phone calls. Sure. But um, I still have it. So I'm, I'm uh, it's, frame it's retired, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> now, Mrs. Onley, when he came home with the news, what was your reaction? Oh, it was just so, I was so excited. This whole realm was, uh, we called it our project, the project. And it was uh, the, from the first initial beginning of being asked by somebody, mm -hmm. would you consider 
having your name submitted to be considered for lieutenant governor. It was basically a, about a 14 month time frame. Oh, it was quite so, long. Mm -hmm. Very long. And yeah. it's been very silent. Yeah. If Couldn't tell you're anyone. going to chat about, you know, anything like this, then you might as well say goodbye to it because we had to really keep, we didn't tell our children or any family members. We didn't tell anybody. Isn't that amazing? Uh, just a couple of contact people who initiated this to begin with. So it was yeah. called The Project. So how's The Project going? Was our, it was like code lingo. And so Which allowed us to chat a little amazing. bit. Yeah. And you say, well, and someone say, well, what's the project? Oh, it's just something we got going at work, and then yeah. you change the su subject. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what's interesting about that, though, is that that's a lot of pressure on you, because as a spouse, uh, as the person themselves, you know, you you accept that there's a risk that it's not going to happen, and that's fine, and you understand implicitly that it could be, it could be, and it could not be, and that's the way it is. As a spouse, though, you think. My spouse is so deserving of this. They're such a great person. I believe they should get it. And that's a lot of stress to, to go through and to not know what the eventual outcome may be. So when you got the positive reaction, it must have been quite wonderful. It was very amazing. And I also had the other uh, reality to feel, well, we, we do need to, if it's a no, it's, it's, we have to think beyond. Right. But when you're preparing 14 months, preparing to consider it yeah it's all exciting and very positive and, and wonderful but and yeah. the reason is because when you <laughs> because when you've been asked right and, and I thought about it and yeah. literally prayed about it for about four months before saying to the person okay I'll let the name wow. my name stand my goodness. because I had to make up my mind do I really want to go for, for this sure. you know do I really want my name to stand yeah. and because what you're really then saying is well do you really want to be the lieutenant governor do you really want to have that job uh, and have that amount of exposure to yourself, to your family. Yes. Do you really want that set of responsibilities? You can't think that, well, I'm going to let my name stand, but it's okay, I won't get it. Right. You have to, I'll let my name stand because maybe yeah. I will. And so you have to think it right through. So tell me what it was that you both really wanted to do with the role that made it so attractive as a possibility to both of you. Well, for me, it was right from the outset. It was uh, to be able to uh, not only do the role itself, to, to be uh, literally Her Majesty's representative, uh, because I knew a fair bit about uh, the role and responsibilities of Lieutenant Governor, and, and because I am a monarchist, I, I had understood that. And as a reporter, I'd been at many, many events over the years, uh, where various lieutenant governors um, had, had been you know, doing their different events, really from John Blackair to Mr. Alexander to uh, Mr. Jackman to Hillary Weston to James Bartleman. So I, I had a very good idea of what the job was. Um, but I also realized that each of them had a, a social and a cultural context to their job of advancing different causes. And for mine, it was the promotion of accessibility. Right. I really felt, and I, and I still believe, that that's been one of the enormous things that I has give, this position has given me an opportunity to promote in an apolitical way, and that is the importance of accessibility for people who have disabilities, and right. more significantly, uh, the promotion of uh, employment opportunities for people with disabilities. Right. So those were really the two goals right from the outset. You yourself um, have lived since you were three, three and about with polio mm -hmm. with a disability. When you arrived here at Queen's Park, was it accessible? Partially. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and for a you know, building that's well over a century old, yeah. uh, improvements and modifications have been made and there were uh, two uh, wheelchair accessible entrances that is uh, ramped. Uh, and then uh, a third one that was added on to the north wing. But even within this suite of offices, mm -hmm. which occupies three floors of the building, it meant that if I wanted to get from one floor to another, because I have difficulty with stairs, I can use them, but I, right. I find it very tiring, um, I would literally have to go down the hall about uh, 150 feet, take the exterior elevator, go down the floor, and then enter my own office a, a second time. Wow. So. Fortunately, uh, and to uh, the great appreciation of the uh, provincial government, they stepped up to the plate in terms of their commitment to the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, right. um, where vintage buildings, heritage buildings like these, do cause uh, the greatest amount of difficulty. And a very creative way was found to uh, install an elevator. So now this 
suite of offices is fully accessible ground level entrance from the west entrance of the building and it makes the whole suite accessible and we've had many many guests and wheelchairs and walkers have, and uh, people yeah. with difficulties being able to use it now mrs only one of the things um, that i've noticed is that you're very you seem to be at least very involved in the work that your husband is doing as well mm -hmm. and i would probably say more involved than many other um, spouses have been up to this point mm -hmm. if that been a deliberate choice mm -hmm. it has um, when it was first presented uh, I asked what what would I be doing and they said you can do whatever you want to do <laughs> what an open statement and so I, I had to sort of understand what that meant whatever you want to do and I wanted to be present I wanted to uh, accompany I wanted to support I wanted to know um, what the uh, events were who the people were I, I thought what a privilege what an honor to be able to. Mm -hmm. What woman goes to her husband's work, place of work? Not, it's not typical, and, I, and I, I understand that, but to me it's just an honor, and it's, a, it's above all it's a privilege to mm -hmm. be able to do that. And so I just felt I wanted to, for <laughs> lack of a better word, stand by my man. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, how, that's how I feel. If I can support it, um, doesn't diminish who I am. Sure. It, en it enhances the office of, I think. I think it, it increases the, um, what, I guess, the, the, the role. Mm -hmm. it, it increases the relevance. Mm -hmm. um, and I just love participating. I love being at events. And I, I'm, I'm always asking, if I couldn't be there for whatever reason, yeah. I usually ask, well, who is there and what was, because it, it's just such a privilege. Sure. And so I don't. And it's a short miss. time, too, mm -hmm. isn't it? I it mean, is. Um, relatively speaking, it's yeah. a short time. This is your fifth year? Yes. Yeah. So it, it's constitutionally yeah. it's, uh, described as not less than five years, and, and typically terms either go five years or five years and a bit. Yeah. And uh, the Prime Minister has generously extended my term by uh, a number of months to take it into the very early part of 2013 so oh. that we can get through the and uh, participate fully in uh, both the Queen's Diamond Jubilee yeah. uh, as well as the uh, bicentennial of the War of 1812, which here in the province of Ontario, there are just enormous celebrations huh. being scheduled right through to the end of the year and actually into 2013 as well. Yeah. Along with the Grey Cup, uh, 100th anniversary, right. right being here in Toronto, and of I'm course. the honorary uh, chair of the uh, Grey Cup Festival Week, which I'm thrilled about because I I'm a big CFL are. fan. Boy, that's going to be Me a party. too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <For sure. Yeah. laughs> well, you know, um, I should I should take us a step back now and and um, allow our viewers to have a little bit of an understanding also of where you both came from. Mm -hmm. um, you both came from uh, well, you came from a small community mm -hmm. uh, in, in Ontario, and you came from this area. Am mm -hmm. I correct in the Toronto area? Both uh, and a little bit of uh, definitely a beginning in a small town of Midland, Ontario, right. about um, 100 miles north of Toronto. Yeah. And uh, but we moved to Toronto when I was seven okay and uh, but that was for medical reasons too because my parents were informed that you know i was going to be in for a series of operations and there's going to be therapy and uh the reality was there were better better medical facilities and rehab facilities sure. in toronto yeah. so uh so the family moved to toronto wow. and uh, is it a big family or is it a big well family? Uh, i have uh, two younger brothers and uh, younger sisters so, um, it's, yeah, total of five, five and, yeah, five of us. So. And your honor is yours, a big two older brothers. Two older brothers, mm -hmm. okay. And myself. Yeah. So when, when Ruth and I met, and uh, she being from small town Ontario, mm -hmm. there, there was still a, a real attraction to me to the small town because it really did bring back very, very deep memories of I bet. Uh, my childhood. You know, um, do you remember the? Do you remember having polio? And yeah. do you remember you do? Right? Yeah, I just remember knowing and understanding that something had really gone wrong because my body wasn't working. I right. just, you know, I, I couldn't really move or move very little. And uh, but my mother, uh, and of course polio. This is back in the late summer of '53. Uh, people, parents were worried about it. The, the vaccines weren't available, and it, you know, if an epidemic broke out or kids were getting it, I mean, people were staying indoors. I mean, it was a very uh, fearful time. So uh, it, she was fairly aware that even as the doctor was on the way to come and uh, check me out, that there was a good possibility oh, that, that I had it. it. 
But she also said that there was something that I said at that point mm. that she thought, well, he, he's, he's going to get through this because, I, I don't remember saying this, but she, we had a big uh, maple tree in our front lawn. And uh, apparently I said to her, Mom, there's a gray squirrel up on the top of that tree. I want you to go get him and bring him down so I can play with him. So, <laughs> she knew you were going to be. See, okay. I figured if I was, you know, in the state that yeah. I was in, looking yeah. ahead, that I wanted her to climb the tree to get the squirrel so I could play with him. <laughs> You'd be fine. Yeah. Now, you um, you talked about the operations and having to move to Toronto, and um, it it occurred to me that you dealt with a lot more physical pain. Yeah than almost any child yep. ever has to deal with. How did you cope with that as a little kid? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, it, I came from a very devout family, and it, it certainly grounded my faith in the right. sense that, uh, well, it doesn't physically make the pain go away. Um, it does give you a sense, your, your faith does, that there's a, there's a higher purpose. It's just, you just can't understand it. And of course, that's the great mystery of suffering, human suffering anyway. Why? Why does this happen to uh, a small child? Why does this happen to any child? Why does it happen to any adult? You know, we, it's one of the great mysteries of, uh, of life. But um, I, I don't know. I think it was a matter that that uh, spiritual grounding that I had as a young boy um, became more meaningful and more real to me. Uh, it certainly didn't make me a... a perfect little boy. I certainly got disciplined as much as my brothers and sisters. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah, the odd sore bottom yeah. here and there. You know. Actually, you were treated very much like the other siblings. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, actually, yeah. go downstairs and have his bedroom downstairs for a year or two, and they switched yeah. around, not having all the bedrooms on the main level. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I remember you told me that. Yeah. But, you know, I think that's a really good point because scares. as a parent, we might tend to either overprotect or treat mm -hmm. a child differently who was going through a medical issue of some sort. Yeah. And I think it's really good to hear that you were afforded the same type of um, uh, both punishment and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and love that they were as well. Yeah. So. Well, I think at the, at the same time, it actually caused me some difficulty in my teenage years because I, I actually grew up uh, not really perceiving that I had any kind of significant disability. Which so clearly was it a I did. Shock when someone yeah. pointed it out yeah. to you. Yeah, and that, that I, you know, I sort of in my late teens, and uh, you know, as all teenagers are, you become aware of your body and yeah. body shape, and yeah. uh, you know, and, and all of a sudden, you know, I, I wasn't growing as tall as I probably would have. Uh, although my my brother, uh, one brother is my height, and he's yeah. not had any adversity. So, uh, in terms of a, a physical condition, um, but you know, th that's when it did start to hit me. And uh, so um, I, I had issues to, to wrestle with and, uh, you know, receive wise advice, uh, wise, wise counsel. But there was a stretch of time in my late teens and early 20s where it was, uh, it was a difficult stretch of time. Yeah, I bet it was. Now, at what stage did the two of you meet? Hmm. Well, I'd finished university. I'd done one year of law school. It only took me about... Uh, a week to realize I was never going to be a lawyer. Okay, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you stuck it up for a whole year. For a whole year oh, because you, I had this enormous. Dad was a lawyer. My dad was a lawyer, okay, was a lawyer, was a lawyer and yeah. uh, I just had this. Um, firstborn. Firstborn, yeah, and and, and a type. Be like that. You know, an a type personality, and right. a lot of people who have come through the adversity of disability are a type individuals. Mm -hmm. You just have to have that to to get through it. And, uh, but I was really floundering. I didn't know where I was going to be going and, and what my career was going to be. I'd begun to write a book on the space program, which ended up... Uh, Being a bestseller. Yes, it did. And it led directly to me going into television. Uh, as I was hired right. as uh, both the weatherman as, um, and a, a science reporter. Right. Um, but prior to that, or just around that Well, your time, book also led to your book. meeting your wife now that yes. I think of it, isn't yes. it? Yes, You've it done did. your homework beautifully. You <laughs> opened the door. Oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. And there yeah. was your future. Yeah. <laughs> There's a well, Stella. Actually, yeah, she did. <laughs> because her cousin, it was her roommate. Yeah, we were uh, roommates. My cousin and I shared an apartment, yeah. and I was singing professionally at the dinner clubs right. at night. She was working for General and for the Publishing. And she was working for the General Publishing Company that was publishing his book, and she was also doing 
head of the promotional tours, like anything with radio or anything. Mm -hmm. So David came over one evening to our apartment just as I'm opening the door actually to head out to a sing at the Skyline Hotel. She's wearing time. this stunning red <laughs> dress with a red choker. His and red long gown. With beautiful blonde hair. Dark. And then, you and were don't, smitten. Don't get me wrong, her, her cousin is a beautiful woman and still is a beautiful woman, but I took one look at Ruth and thought, whoa, <laughs> I'm taking the wrong family member out tonight. <laughs> and unfortunately, my first impression was just, uh, uh, you know, you judge a book by its cover. There's David standing there. I thought, hmm, that's not a bad looking guy, but he had a cane. Interesting. And I, yeah. and I, I just thought, Kind of, kind of awkward. Yeah. There's a bit of an awkward gait to him. David didn't always have sc scooters. The, right. the actual visual disability is much more pronounced now because he, he's in a scooter. Yeah. But so anyway, but it took a couple of years actually. Uh, so it wasn't anything on my heart at all. Right. Just thought he was a nice looking man. And he thought you were a real yeah. looker. <laughs> there oh, you yeah. go. But so I met him again. You did, and then yeah. it just basically at, at, progressed from there. Yeah. It did. About four years later. It was actually at church yeah. it was because um, I'd had a a very different spiritual journey in those couple of years right. and I a different changed. spiritual journey because you you were and remain a professional singer mm -hmm. um, do you mean that because you were involved in a different type of world that I mean that the professional singing world kind of took you away from the faith that you it did I'd growing it, up I or? think you, you definitely said something yeah. important that it, it took me away and I found my way back basically right. a prodigal daughter in terms of my spiritual faith, in terms of my relationship right. with God and and things uh, of the spiritual Christian faith. Yeah. And so I, when I did see him again, and it was at church, yeah. at York Minster Park Baptist Church, which was our, his family's church, and I happened to be there because it was part of our family's church of my Toronto relatives, so we meet. And um, things change in my view of him and about his life and about his abilities and, and, and then a friend called and so I, I was abracast here's this beautiful girl from four years earlier who right. really had nothing didn't want anything to do with me at that time and so here she is coming to our church and it's like now the second or the third Sunday in a row that you've uh, yeah. she, had, she had come back so I'm thinking hey, this is pretty good and, uh, and then you know a mutual friend called up to uh, just simply say uh, well Ruth has made a real spiritual renewal and a spiritual commitment and um, I just said good I'm gonna marry her <laughs> did you really yeah oh my goodness and I went oh. whoa where did that come from well it came from deep within and six months later I proposed and, and did you accept yes. yeah yeah we, we had a very short engagement yeah. really six months not a long until, uh, sorry, sorry yeah short engagement six months we're married un until I went home and told my mother now they, they you know you, you look back and realize that the family were very aware that all of this was happening we right. didn't think they were aware right. you think you're being subtle yes but, exactly yeah. so I told my mother and I said uh, that I'd propose and Ruth had said yes and I said mom I said I know it's right but I, I just have only one thing and it's such a short it's only been six months uh, how long were you and dad going out before dad proposed and she said oh not long and I said well like how long and she said six weeks <laughs> <laughs> and my, mom <laughs> my family had always told me Ruth when you when you know you'll know and you did and I knew Interesting. yeah I you know I way it is. you talked about your first impression mm -hmm. uh, that those four years earlier mm -hmm. and I wonder how um, you have to deal daily um, mm -hmm. with the effects of your disability yep. and how it might limit you or what it might allow you to do in the world mm -hmm. to make it a better place but you also have to deal with the effects mm -hmm. and I wonder how it has um, what kind of an impact it has had on your own life uh, being married to someone with a disability uh, it is an impact it is real it, it, it's real it's not only me it's our children right so they know what their father they know the limitations it, it's a pretty huge thing and I always look myself I, I look at someone like Rick Hansen's wife uh, mm -hmm. and you know he's wheelchair yeah. it, David walks he has different capacities uh, I look at other couples too uh, Justin Hines, wonderful Canadian musician, mm -hmm. his wife. Um, I see the realities, but in in my heart, it's it's what is beyond. It's so it's the abilities and and the character of the human being. Mm -hmm. it's, it's I know the impact is there in terms of um, it. It changes how you. We don't go out and run together. We don't go out right. and skate together. We 
it, walk and roll. it's a different thing. And if I can walk and roll, we, yes, we did. We went we for a walk and roll last night. I walked, and he's on the on scooter. The scooter. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Let's go for a walk and roll. <laughs> so it's adjusting, but it's accepting what is the most important. Mm. So and and I think uh, you know what we have experienced together has helped me and has helped us as mm. we talk to other people about the whole aspect of accessibility because when I uh, I do presentations I say when you you meet someone for the first time and they have a physical disability or some some kind of disability that seems obvious to you what do you see do you see the ability within or do you see the disability and we all want to say well no we see the ability but we don't we all see the disability especially in such a visual culture exactly yeah. exactly and yeah. uh, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't let it form the basis of a value judgment about sure. the person and um, and we've been taught that lesson ourselves uh, through the last number of years in office where we've we've met different individuals who on that first impression you think wow this is a real adversity that this person has got and then they open their mouth and they sing or they open their mouth and right. say something that's very profound or speak in an articulate way or without any verbal communication present you with stunning art right. that neither of us could even begin to think to do yeah and so you know i think that's one of the the lessons that's going on in our culture right now in terms of accessibility and understanding other people is that we we do have to look beyond that first impression and i think the fact that we have become in in so many ways such an amazing multicultural society and a multilinguistic society it augurs well because we we have been able to achieve uh, such an amazing degree of integration in our society with really, relatively speaking, uh, very few problems. And I know it's one of the things that I hear all the time when I receive ambassadors or I receive consul generals. Virtually every single one of them wants to talk about how we've been able to make okay. our multicultural experience work because they see it. And, and admire it. And admire it. They know that they don't have it in their own nation or they have it to a, yeah. a lesser extent. Hmm. Now, the first time that you were in this room, I understand, Mrs. Onley, was to sing O Canada. Is that right? <laughs> and then you came back as her honor. <laughs> I told yeah. her not to take the tape and be measuring the grapes. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was November 06, the Senior Achievement Award. Yes. And this whole thing was just still silent and quiet. It was The announcement was yes. July of 07. So that's, that's well six months before. And knowing that the potential could be there, it... it it was amazing, actually, and um, I've done it many times anyway sure. for different lefty governors. And you're governors. still singing here, too, right? I, I mean, yes, yeah. I've even I've even sung in Hero Canada yeah. uh, for for an event. So yeah. that's lovely. It is. It's it's a it's a real honor. As we finish up in our last 30 seconds or so, I wonder what you're both proudest of in the past uh, five years in this role. Is there is there one thing that each of you looks at and says, that's really been I'm proud of that legacy that I'll leave behind. Uh, I would hope changing people's perceptions about accessibility and employment opportunities for people with disabilities. And I, I think I'm making real progress on that. On the family side, I would say eldest son getting married and being happily married, uh, middle son completing law school, and uh, youngest son well on his way to completing university while at the same time mom and dad were very very busy yeah. and uh, didn't have quite as much time as we would have liked that's excellent i agree okay. oh, that's... i agree with my husband <laughs> <laughs> well i do truly appreciate that you would both take the time to uh, to join me today it's been a, a delight to chat with you and i wish you all the best both with the rest of your time here and, and whatever you may choose to do next thank I you we'll all thank be you watching Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's special for us to have you here. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. In action. We're in an unprecedented situation. The word that he gave in the House was worthless. Uh, frankly, I think what they're doing is a disgrace. For those who like 
a second opinion. Scrums, see it on CPAC, politics in action.